I'm Roger McGregor. The next five minutes will show you scenes from the 55-minute video for the McGregor 26. The video shows just about everything there is to know about this remarkable boat. You'll see all of the reasons why the McGregor 26 is the world's best-selling cruising sailboat. I hope you like what you see. This boat is one of the fastest, safest, and best handling of any of the tradable cruising sailboats. It's a very easy boat to learn to sail. Here we have a very fast cabin cruise. A 60 horsepower outboard gives you more than 20 miles per hour. Try this with any other sailboat. It's not the fastest ski boat in the world, and you'll never pull a crowd, but you can have an awful lot of fun. Unlike most waterbound sailboats that are limited to their local waters, these boats can easily be trailered to any lake, river, or ocean. The boat sits low on its trailer, lower than its competitors. It can be floated off the trailer without drowning your car. With the boat in the water, a valve is opened and it takes on 1,150 pounds of water ballast. This provides the self-riding stability that the boat requires for sailing. This is the mast raising system. It's so easy a kid can do it. Rigging and launching the boat takes less than 10 minutes. This is as simple as it looks. The ballast is drained to keep the boat light for easy trailering. The boat will float in 12 inches of water and you can run it right up on the beach. The cozy weathertight cabin provides two large double berths and two singles. The rear berth is as large as a queen size bed. There's a fully enclosed head just forward of the mirrored bulkhead. You have to spend a lot more money to find these accommodations in a power boat. Notice the large rear berth. This is the hull with the deck removed, so you can see the berth, the galley, the dinette, and the head. The big galley slides back under the cockpit seats to make lots of seating room in the main cabin. This is the big rear berth with lots of headroom. The dinette table lowers to make a very large single berth fully enclosed head, an absolute necessity for any voyage lasting more than a few hours. For privacy, it has a good solid door. The mast rotates, as it does on many catamarans, to align with the mainsail. This greatly increases the mainsail's power. Here we see the boat sailing with its big Genoa jib in a brisk 20 mile an hour wind. This is the smaller working jib. This is the cruising spinnaker. It's colorful and fun to fly. When sailing downwind or across the wind, it adds a lot of speed. When it blows hard, or when you're feeling lazy, you need less sail. Here it's sailing with just the mainsail. Here the Genoa is rolled in on its furler, and the main is reefed. This is for really heavy winds. When the boat is going faster than 7 miles per hour, you can open the transit valve and the ballast tank will automatically empty, lightening the boat for higher speed. We pull the boat over with the ballast tank full. It takes 130 pounds at the top of the mast to hold it down like this. When the mast is released, the boat rights itself. We drilled a big hole in the bottom and let it fill. The solid foam flotation keeps it afloat. It won't sail fast this way, but it beats swimming. Southern California normally has gentle weather. However, in April 2009, we had some unusual weather conditions. For three days, very strong winds blew from the northwest, creating some really big waves. On April 16th, the Coast Guard posted gale warnings, and we took a McGregor 26 out of the Newport Boat Show and went sailing. The camera boat's anemometer averaged about 42 miles per hour with gusts of 51. Some of the waves appeared to be about 18 feet high. We found the biggest waves about 10 miles off the coast.
This big wave startled me enough to make me drop the camera. We don't recommend sailing in this stuff. However, if you get caught out in nasty conditions, it might be reassuring to know that the boat has been out there and done that. When these big waves hit the beach, the California surfers will go totally crazy. We build this boat in one of the most modern and efficient plants in the industry. Here are the fiberglass pieces that make up the 26. A finished boat is being pulled from this mold. Notice the molded in accent stripes. After all the hardware is installed on the hull and deck, the two finished parts are joined. A completed boat rolls off the assembly line every four hours. We've built over 35,000 sailboats over the last 37 years. These boats represent only a few days production. We'll finish this introduction with a few pleasant scenes that give you an idea what the McGregor 26 is all about. Now I'll take you through the next 50 minutes showing you everything about our 26. You'll see lots of sailing, powering, water skiing, launching and rigging. I'll show you in detail how we designed the boat and how they're built. Because of the water ballast system which we developed and which is now the standard throughout the industry, the trailering weight can be kept low, allowing the 26 to be trailered by standard cars. The empty boat weighs only 2,250 pounds. The trailer weighs 710. The boat's width is just under 8 feet and can be legally trailered throughout the United States without permits. Permits are frequently required for widths over 8 feet and always required for loads over 8 foot 6 inches. Watch how easy this is. The boat sits low on its trailer, making launching very simple. The bow tie is released, the skipper starts the motor and backs the boat off the trailer. The boat's quite happy with all of this. This is the typical ramp. Everybody stays dry and the car stays out of the water. Every inch higher a boat sits on its trailer means that the car has to go one foot further down the ramp. Thirty inches. These are Catalina 22s. Thirty-six and a half inches. This is 125. 56 inches. These are Catalina 25s with their tracking keels. 47 inches. This is 123. That's 33 inches to the scribed water line and to the little stub line where it's been sitting in the water. 126 measures 36 inches. Here's 123. Look how far into the water the car had to go. This poor soul cranked ferociously for an eternity. He'll be getting tired. Extension tongues are frequently used, as for this Catalina 22. Ramps are designed for normal length traders, and one of these long ones goes off the paved part. Major outside help is often needed. Or, you can always just wade in there. If you listen really carefully, you can hear the dishes breaking. As the boat powers onto the trader, watch how the trader's rear goal posts, seen here sticking out of the water, keep the boat centered and aligned. Some traders don't have these. Without the posts, things can get a little screwed up. With the 26, you simply drive on and go forward to tie off the nose. Go down the ladder and stay out of the water. Without the ladder, securing the boat can be fun for the spectators. The boat's light and can easily be pulled up the ramp and out of the water. If the boat's too heavy, you'll get a lot of this. If the designer had given this rig another couple of inches, this skipper's life would have been improved immensely. 
When you pull the 26, our engine clears the ground in the down position. To sail like this, you need ballast to keep the boat upright. With the boat in the water, a valve's opened, and the ballast tank fills with 1,150 pounds of water. The water ballast nearly half the way to the boat substitutes for the fixed lead or cast iron keels found in other sailboats. This is the water ballast valve. When you launch the boat, the valve is opened and the water tank fills. Gravity does the work. When you retrieve the boat, drain the tank to lighten it for trailering. Now we'll talk about raising the mast. First disconnect it from the bow pulpit and roll the mast base to the rear and slide the hinge pin in place. This is really easy to do. It can also be done on the trailer. As the mast goes up, the load gets lighter. The four stays then connected to the front of the boat. This is the line that keeps the top of the mast raising pole from falling to the rear as the mast goes up and down. This is the winch. It's a brake winch and you crank it both up and down. The loads are very light. The mast lowers neatly into its carrier. You can leave the carrier on while sailing. Or you can remove it. Here is a view of the port rudder going down and then up. Bridges are everywhere and the good sailing is often on the other side. Here's the solution. There are storage yards like this near many of the best launching ramps. They're a lot cheaper than in the water moorings. Here's the interior. On the left is the galley and a long sofa. There's a very large, nearly queen-size berth under the cockpit and a large V-berth toward the front. The dinette's on the right and the head is forward of the mirrored bulkhead. The large galley slides to the rear to make lots of seating room. Here's the big rear berth, the galley, dinette head, and forward berth. The galley's in the forward position. The deck's been removed so you can get a good view. Here the galley's in the rear position. The sink and stove are still usable, but it covers up some of the rear berth. Even with the galley aft, the rear berth is still a good double. The dinette table's now down to form a big single berth. The galley is being moved from the front to the rear. It's easy and frees up a lot of space for a big group to sit around the table. The sofa seat also makes a big single berth. The boat will sleep six. This is too much of a crowd, but it is possible. On the galley top, there's room for an alcohol stove, which has a good cutting board that covers the burner when not in use. Here's another view of the interior. Check out the big mirror on the bulkhead. The galley is in the forward position. This is looking aft. With the galley forward, there's good access to the rear berth on the port side. Here's the view from behind the galley. Here's another view from the rear. The dinette seat back has been removed so you have a better view. There's a place behind the dinette seat for a large carry-on ice chest. Again, this is the galley in the rear position. You still have complete access to the sink and stove without moving the galley forward. You can push it even further aft to get more room in the main cabin. Here's a good view of the dinette converted to a big single berth. 
It's seven and a half feet long. Here's another view of the galley. The dinette seat backs easily removed for access to the rear berth. The rear berth is a full six foot six inch by five foot nine inch, nearly as large as an American queen size bed or a European king size. This is rare in any boat. There's full sitting headroom over a large area. This is the head, the fully enclosed head. Many other boats have a head tucked under a bunk. These are awful to use when others are on the boat. It's essential to have walls and a good solid door. Here's the electrical panel. It's easy to reach from the cockpit. The windows are large and are placed so that you can see out while working at the galley or while seated on the cabin seats. The forward view from the cabin can be quite rewarding. With most sailboats, you're stuck with small side windows and usually no forward window. There are a lot of convenient places to store stuff, big and small. Here we took out the cushions and hatch covers. There's a big storage compartment under each of the seats and berths. These are the V-berth hatches. This is the vent for the water tank. It allows the air to get out as the water comes in. There's a high dam around it to keep water out of the boat the main inlet valves on the transom. The battery is located under the ladder. There's room for a second battery or for a pair of larger batteries. Warning labels containing the important news are inside the hull and on the steering pedestal. Here's the boat at anchor on a quiet night. It'll be hard to find a more cozy, comfortable interior on a small sailboat or powerboat. While we're scanning, I'll add a side note. Insurance. Many homeowners policies automatically cover boats under 26 feet with relatively low horsepower. This one generally qualifies. A big cost saving. The cockpit's big and self-bailing. The seats are over six feet long and very comfortable, big enough for sleeping outside or for sunbathing. The boat has really big front windows. The strong mast hinge allows the mast to be raised and lowered and rotate from side to side. Here we have the anchor roller, the furler, and the forward mooring cleats. The anchor locker will hold a large anchor and lots of line and chain. The foredeck hatch gives lots of ventilation. This is the track and car for the small jib. And for the Genoa. The lifelines and bow pulpit help keep you on the boat. Here's another view of the cockpit. The main sheet travelers at the front end of the seats. Under the cockpit seats, there are places for two 12 gallon fuel tanks. Wheel steering is a lot more natural than a tiller, and it takes a lot less space in the cockpit. The hinged captain's seat closes to secure the cockpit area. It keeps such things as cameras, pets, or the crew from sliding out the back of the boat into the water. This is the boarding ladder. The cabin seals up tight to keep out rain and spray. And the boat can be secured to help keep out the bad guys. Here's the sunshade. There's lots of headroom, and the boat can be sailed and powered with it in this position. Unlike a centerboard, the daggerboard has no underwater pins that require maintenance, and there's no underwater drag from a large centerboard trunk. 
Unlike a centerboard, it can be removed while the boat's on its trailer or while in the water, and the housing takes up a lot less room in the cabin. The rudders can be raised and lowered from the cockpit. If you hit something while sailing, they'll kick up out of the way. Fixed keels, fixed rudders, and exposed centerboards make this maneuver impossible. The daggerboard retracts fully into the hull. The 26 has a rotating mast, allowing the mast to line up with the airflow across the mainsail. These are found on almost all modern high-performance catamarans. With a fixed mast, there's a lot of turbulence along the forward third of the mainsail. The rotating mast smooths out this flow, providing more forward thrust and a lot less sideways push. It's a major reason why the boat's so fast. The mainsail now becomes so efficient that you can sail without the jibber geno and still make good speed. It aligns itself to the proper angle without human intervention. We use stay adjusters here because turnbuckles flex, bend, and occasionally fail as a result of the mast being raised and lowered. This is the boom fang. It's not essential, but it makes for much better sail shape and a lot more speed. The rudders and the motor turn together for exceptional control. The motor can be disconnected from the rudders to allow easy steering while sailing. And now for some sailing. The boat's sailing with its Genoa jib in a brisk 20 mile per hour wind. This is the Pacific Ocean, just outside Angel's Gate the entrance to Los Angeles very busy harbor. The rig's quite pretty, very efficient and very strong. A boat that is fast and that handles well like this one is easier to sail and safer. It will certainly yield greater long-term enjoyment than one that is slow and unresponsive. You can learn to sail in a single afternoon. Read our excellent sailing instruction manual as posted on our website. Choose a nice day with a light breeze when you don't have to get anywhere in particular. Turn on the engine and power around. Then put up the mainsail and let the wind provide some of the power. The engine will get you out of any tight spots. In a tug-of-war between the engine and the sails, the engine will win. After you see how it all works, try the jib. It's one of the easiest boats to sail that you will ever find. A real test of a sailboat is how well it sails in light wind. Check out the flag. Almost nothing, but the boat keeps moving. The price of the 26 is similar to the price of the best-selling, full-size, four-door cars delivered in California. Our prices are way less than those of our competitors. This is the boat sailing with the smaller jib. Back to boat prices. Don't be taken in by the old adage, you get what you pay for. It's often the inefficient builder's rationalization for his higher prices. Be sure that what you pay for is not a builder's high overhead, excessive advertising expenditures, equipment that you do not want or need, unnecessarily complex designs, poor inventory control, lack of well-engineered production tooling, or a wide range of other wasteful business or manufacturing processes. These are of no value to you, but their costs are invariably passed on to you in the form of higher prices. We have one of the most efficient boat building plants in the world, and the result is a fine product with a very low price.
Here's the boat sailing close to into the wind in lumpy seas and tacking. Some boats are difficult to tack and end up dead in the water. It's called getting in irons. Not this one. Even in choppy waters and brisk winds, it comes around fast without losing a lot of speed. This scene shows the boat going through 180 degrees from one course to the other. In really light winds such as this, many boats have trouble doing this. Not so here. In extremely light wind, the boat still sails very well. The boat is sailing in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Cornwall, England. Here's a race between the new 26, the darker hull, and our previous boat, the 26X. The speed difference is the result of the rotating mast, somewhat more sail area, and the elimination of drag from the centerboard opening in the bottom of the 26X's hull. Both boats are fast, but the new one's slightly faster. Here's a pair of our McGregor 65s. These are among the fastest production sailboats ever built. Here's the big race in very, very light air with our McGregor 70. The outcome was never in doubt. This is an example of blanketing where one boat, the 70, steals the other boat's wind. We handicapped the 70 by removing its giant Genoa jib. Now we have a fair race. Two boats going the same direction always results in a race and sailboat racing is fun. At low speed, you can use both the engine and the sails. When cruising at low speed in rough water, the sails keep the boat from rolling and give you a more comfortable trip. We are sailing fast and cheating. The engine's running. It's not smart to power at high speed with the sails up because your forward speed can create really strong winds that can overpower the boat. Since we're sailing in so close to a rocky and nasty jetty, we left the engine running at idle to get us out of any trouble, like having the wind quit. The sails are strapped in tight to lean the boat way over to expose the windward rudder and part of the dagger board. With the boat heeled over like this, the other rudder is deep in the water and working well. On a boat with just one centerline rudder, if the boat heels over too much, control can be lost. This is the big racing spinnaker set on a long removable bowsprit. It has a lot of power and can drive the boat at planing speeds. Jibing the racing spinnaker is easy. There's so much gap between the front of the sail, the tip of the bowsprit, and the boat's forward permanent headstay, the sail just passes right through on its way to the other side. This is the boat sailing close into the wind with the big chute. This is the small cruising spinnaker. It fastens to the nose of the boat and not to the end of the long bow spring. It tacks and jibes just like a Genoa. The boat here is really moving. Notice a smooth, clean wake. Sailing across the wind or downwind, it adds a lot of speed. No extra hardware is required for this sail.
The boat is sailing with just the mainsail. With the rotating catamaran style mast, the mainsail alone is far more effective than it would be with a conventional mast. This rig is perfect for high winds, learning to sail, or for just lazy sailing. This is where the rotating mast pays off big time. The 26 can easily be tacked to adjust the mainsail. The mainsail powers up quickly on the new course and the boat's on its way. When the wind increases, we roll the jib or Genoa up on the furler. The furling line leads back to the cockpit. In heavier wind, the boat's moving along nicely with a reefed main and partially rolled Genoa. In strong winds with reduced sail area, it'll be faster, easier to sail. This is the reefed main at a nearly full Genoa. In New Zealand, the boat is sailing just with the Genoa. Southern California normally has gentle weather. However, in April 2009, we had some unusual weather conditions. For three days, very strong winds blew from the northwest, creating some really big waves. On April 16th, the Coast Guard posted gale warnings, and we took a McGregor 26 out of the Newport Boat Show and went sailing. Here's the Coast Guard gale warning as we left the harbor. The double red flags mean gale force winds 39 to 54 miles per hour. The camera boat was our McGregor 70 Anthem, seen here in less violent conditions. Mike Inman, our Newport Beach dealer, and Jeff Inman, his son, sailed the 26. I'm Roger McGregor, I skipper the 70 and took the pictures. Anthem Santamometer averaged about 42 miles per hour, true wind, with gusts to 51. Some of the waves appeared to be about 18 feet high. We found the biggest waves about 10 miles off the coast. This is one of those don't try this at home things. In a small boat, you don't want to mess around with an ocean this unruly. It's best to watch from the beach. This big wave startled me enough to make me drop the camera. We don't recommend sailing in this stuff. However, if you get caught out in nasty conditions, it might be reassuring to know that the boat has been out there and done that. When these big waves hit the beach, the California surfers will go totally crazy. And now we go fast. All this is being done with a light, quiet, fuel-efficient 60 horsepower motor. We limit the engine to 60 horsepower for a number of reasons. An electric start 60 provides a lot of speed, yet it's light enough so that sailing performance is not compromised. It's about the largest engine that can be started by hand, a nice feature if your battery goes dead. Over the years, there have been many attempts to make a good combination power boat and sailboat. Most have been failures because they were too heavy or had unsuitable hull shapes. There's absolute proof that it can be done without compromising sailing or powering. And here it comes. The 26 has two engines, the sails and the motor. If a conventional power boat's engine quits when you're offshore or on a remote part of the lake, you're stuck there until outside help arrives. With this boat, raise the sails and head for home. This is Catalina Island, 20 miles off California's coast. In the background is St. Anthony's Lighthouse, marking the entrance to England's Falmouth Harbor.
New Zealand again. And back to Catalina. The new 26M is slightly faster than our prior 26X. Both boats have identical engines and carry the same weight. The new boat's in the foreground. This is a drag race. The older boat jumps up on a plane a bit more quickly, but the newer boat slowly pulls ahead. The McGregor 70 may be faster under sail, but it's no contest under power. The 70 is going 13 miles per hour, fast for a sailboat, and the 26 zooms right on by. The 26 is not as fast as this one. Or this one. Back to reality. And now for water skiing. You can't do this with other sailboats. Sometimes launches go well. And sometimes they don't. A single ski works pretty well. As does a wakeboard. The boarding ladder makes getting in and out easy. The ladder's retracted. And the captain's seat is closed. You can drag the kids around on just about anything. We drilled a hole in the bottom and let it fill. The solid foam flotation keeps it afloat. Most boats of this size do not offer this essential safety feature, and their heavy keels can pull them straight to the bottom if they're damaged or flooded. With the water tank full and my 180 pounds on the rail, there's very little tipping. With other boats, you'll see some really serious tipping when loaded like this. With the water tank full, we pull the boat over on its side. It takes about 130 pounds at the top of the mast to hold it down like this. When the mast is released, it rights itself in about one second. The mast is sealed to help prevent a complete rollover. Engines can quit. For a boat without sails, here's one solution. Embarrassing, but a solution. With sails, you can get home, or you can just paddle. Here are a few scenes that tell better than words what this sport is all about. There's no lower cost or nicer way to spend time than sailing. And there are a few things in the world that are as quiet, graceful, romantic, and just downright fun. There's a lot of interesting stuff on the oceans and waterways. This is an offshore oil rig. Environmentalists hate them, but they make great racing marks, especially at night. Many shorelines are loaded with wonderful restaurants. These can really brighten a voyage. Sailing should not be without luxury. 
The big dome is where the Howard Hughes flying boat was kept. This is the Queen Mary, landlocked. There are thousands of quiet coves, anchorages, and secluded waterways. You can get away from the crowds. The boat's a great camper. Stay here overnight. Better yet, anchor on this pretty lake near Yellowstone in Idaho. Anchor it here as long as you want, for free. Launch it at this ramp for two bucks and play on the boat forever. This is the Newport to Ensenada race. There are 500 sailboats out here billing around prior to the start. It tows well. Even dolphins like to play with it. We go for a sail and come back to this, taking over the dock. Now what? This is the Lynx, a replica of an 18th century revenue cutter. The 26 is built in one of the most modern and efficient plants in the industry. We rely heavily on computers in all areas of the business. We use state-of-the-art computer modeling for all design work. We start, like the ancients, with two-dimensional three-view drawings. Each piece of the boat is then converted to three-dimensional line models. Computer simulations are made of every piece of the boat. The pieces are then combined into a complete 3D model. The computer then forms perfect surfaces over the skeleton. This is how Boeing created the 777 airliner. These surfaces are then transferred to a computer-controlled gantry router and the full-size shapes are formed to better than three thousandths of an inch tolerance. Here our router is cutting the surface of the mock-up of the sliding hatch. Now it's cutting a rudder shape. Here it's carving in high-density foam the shape of the front window area of the deck. The computer cut pieces are assembled to form a mock-up of the deck called a plug. It's given a perfect finish. A fiberglass mold is then laid up over the plug. This is the finished plug for the hull. These are the fiberglass pieces that make up the boat. This is the nearly finished hull shell, still in its mold. You can see the molded in water ballast tank and the stiffeners. Next, I'll show you the materials that make up the boat. This is woven fiberglass roving. It provides the basic strength for the laminates. It will take loads of 35,000 pounds per square inch. This is unidirectional glass. It has all the strands going in one direction. This is fiberglass mat. It's made up of short fiberglass filaments. It holds a lot of resin and provides stiffness and rigidity. This is fiberglass cloth. It gives a smooth interior surface and provides strength. The fabrics are cut to exact patterns. Twenty layers are cut in a single pass. The pieces are made up into kits in the order in which they're applied to the boat. We start with a highly polished and waxed three-ton hull mold. The boat is built from the outside in. The areas for blue are masked off. This gun sprays both catalyst and gel coat. The catalyst causes the gel coat to harden. Gel coats a pigmented polyester resin. The masking is removed, leaving a window for the blue. The blue gel coats then applied. The first layer is laid down and wet out with resin. Rollers, squeegees, and brushes are used to remove any air bubbles and excess resin from the laminate. This is where the real quality of the boat is determined. 
After the first layer cures, additional layers of fiberglass mat and fiberglass roving are added. They are wet out with a spray gun and all air is removed from the layout. Here are reinforcing pads being added for a mass support attachment point. Additional layers of mat and roving are applied until all areas of the hull reach their proper thickness. The tan gel coats being sprayed on the hull liner mold. This is the finished hull liner before it gets bonded into the hull. The liner hatch cutouts are trimmed and the finished liner is bonded and fiberglassed in place. After the resin hardens, the hull is removed from its mold. Notice the molded in stripes and the high gloss on the exterior. If the hull mold surface is perfect, the hull surface will be perfect. Here's the deck mold shop, neat and tidy. The deck mold is covered where the black windows will be, and it's ready for white gel coat. The non-skid texture is built into the deck mold. The deck is sprayed with white gel coat. The masking is removed very carefully before the white is cured. Black is then sprayed on the window area and over the entire deck to make it easy to spot air bubbles during the layout process. The first layers of fiberglass fabrics are laid out on the deck's cured gel coat. This is a deck liner mold. And a finished deck liner. The cured deck is being removed from its mold. No further work needs to be done on the outside surface finishes. It even comes out of the mold waxed. These are rudder molds. Here's a drill fixture that locates the holes for the deck hardware. Simple, but foolproof. The steel bushings place the holes exactly where they should be. This larger jig lowers to locate the holes in the cabin top. It also guides the diamond wheeled routers that cut out the windows. This diamond coated saw trims the edge of the hull. This fixture is used to exactly locate the holes in the aluminum masts. We have a lot of automation. Here an overhead gantry router is cutting out the boat's bulkheads, hatches, and trim. When the cuts are completed, the router automatically goes to a turntable containing a variety of tools. It selects a quarter inch drill and moves on to drill all of the quarter inch holes within three thousandths of an inch tolerance. Here it's cutting bunk hatches. It even routes in the identification number to show where the hatch goes. This is number three on the port side. This is the well-organized stockroom where we make kits. When the drilled and trimmed fiberglass parts come into the assembly shop, a complete kit of parts with all of its fasteners is delivered to the assembly station. The kitted parts are installed in the pre-drilled holes and there's little chance for error. Most assembly work is done on the hull and deck before they're joined. Fittings are secured with nylon inserts, stainless steel lock nuts, that will not vibrate loose on the road or under sail. We provide detailed written guidance for each worker, 
and provide him with first-class jigs, fixtures, and tools to permit him to do a perfect job every time. After all of the hardware is installed on the deck and hull, the deck is lowered onto the hull. The deck joint is sealed and fastened with one quarter inch stainless steel bolts and lock nuts. Most competitors use sheet metal screws or pop rivets. This system is better. There's a detailed quality control checklist for every operation. Sign-offs assure that everything's done exactly as specified. We build our own trailers. Our new aluminum trailers offer lighter weight and more corrosion resistance than our previous steel trailers. Here's a cross tube being cut to length. We have a lot of specialized equipment. This hydraulic ram is bending the sturdy aluminum side rails. Here the steel bow stand is being welded together. The bow stand is given a coat of epoxy primer and a final coat of rust resistant high gloss linear polyurethane. The parts are loaded into a heavy strong assembly fixture that assures accuracy to within 1 16th of an inch. This is the hub and disc brake assembly. This is the corrosion proof fiberglass fender. This portable cart holds all the parts and tools for assembly. A boat comes off the line every four hours. All of our waking moments are spent refining this production process for just this boat. These are finished boats about to be delivered. We put two boats in a container. They go by rail to our 63 North American dealers. The boats arrive clean and damage free. The cost is low. Here comes your boat. Anywhere else in the world a ship like this will bring it to you. Lest you forget what goes where, we provide a 28 page owner's manual telling you how to rig the boat and how to care for it. It also provides a wonderful primer on how to sail and all the tips to get the best possible performance. So there, in closing, we'll repeat a few scenes that might tempt you to try one of the most pleasant activities that the world has to offer. The boat gives you your own private island. and You can take it to any lake, river, or ocean. Unlike a boat that must be stored in the water, you're not limited to sailing around your local area. And the high powering speed will allow you to go to places where other sailboats can't reach in the confines of a limited vacation. Volumes have been written about the delights of sailing because it's captivated man's imagination since the beginning of history. There's a line from the classic Wind in the Willows where Mole says to Ratty, there is nothing, my young friend, absolutely nothing. Half so much worth doing is simply messing about in boats. Sailing off on a strong, comfortable, and cozy little yacht will probably do more to brighten your life than almost anything you can imagine.